You, you can all hear me, yeah, and you, we hear you. Yes. Yeah, I hope um, your voice is uh, to this um, workshop on addressing social inequality post COVID. My name is Christoph Stuckerberger. I'm the moderator. I'm based in Geneva. Um, I'm uh, president of three foundations in Geneva on ethics, on uh, social entrepreneurship and on uh, social investments. And uh, I welcome uh, the panelists. Uh, unfortunately, we are still a male uh, panel because the two ladies uh, may be still on the way. We hope that they are coming. And uh, the topic of uh, addressing social inequality post-COVID is an important uh, a topic because uh, we all know and have the figures that uh, COVID uh, shaped uh, the world, uh, create a lot of uh, issues, and uh, um, among others, also a growing social inequality. Is it in access to vaccine? Is it in access now to to capital to bridge this uh, very tough uh, period? Is it in human resources um, uh, management? We will talk about that. Um, maybe you can also um, uh, mute your microphone when uh, you are not speaking uh, in case. Uh, we have uh, the speakers with us. We will proceed in the, say, uh, in the way that every speaker will... Uh, have uh, f four or five minutes, and then uh, with for your statement on this topic, mainly on how is your analysis of it, uh, of the inequality uh, during and post-COVID, and what is are you, the solutions from your angle. <clears throat> and then we hopefully have time for some comments and questions from the plenary, from the participants. We start with a blessing. Uh, I am here, Chief Executive Officer of the Umigini Pipeline Infrastructure Nigeria. You are from the private sector, from a, a key uh, area, the, the, uh, the oil industry and pipeline infrastructure industry in Nigeria. What is your perception? Nigeria is uh, is a huge country. And uh, in this situation of social inequality post-COVID, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Chris. It's a pleasure being here again. And um, nice to have um, this opportunity to have this discussion with um, this great panel. So, yes, um, addressing social inequality post-COVID. I think um, the issue of inequality uh, vary across, but there are some common denominator that we can all draw from across board. So as a private operator, I, I operate in the community. And so the issue of the, the social concern as, as it addresses or as it concerns the community comes to play. Now, during the COVID, there are a few things that came up, you know, um, and these we try in our little way to understand so that we can support and one of it was that the COVID revealed huge you know, um, lack of distribution or unequal distribution of valued resources. Those things that are supposed to be basic, we realize that though they have been there, but the COVID actually exposed the extent of these inequalities that existed in this system, and especially from the community where we operate. I will speak to some of these um, issues that were, were revealed by the COVID. One of them is food for subsistence. So we realized suddenly that people, you know, could not actually, you know, sustain, you know, their ability to provide for their subsistence food-wise. These are people that have been working, doing media jobs. When the COVID eroded these jobs because contractors and many other companies were cutting down their manpower. All of a sudden, we realized that people could not provide for their subsistence. And that was a big issue. The second one was primary health care. So the issue of health care has been a challenge. But the COVID actually also revealed that as people were forced to sit at home, 
all right? So people were not going out. The activity that people were engaged in that kept them healthy and sound automatically were not there. So that revealed the need for, you know, uh, primary health care to be in every locality. Where we operate, for example, we have just about one or two primary health care providers. The question was, how will these people succeed, you know, given that everybody was swarming this healthcare facility? The third one was education. So during the COVID as well, a lot of people turned to digital education. All right. So you needed um, to have some infrastructure to support this. You needed the Internet. You needed maybe a laptop or um, any mobile device to connect. We realized that most of the people in the rural area, they neither had access to computer, nor did they have access to the Internet. So pupils and students in these areas were cut off from learning at that point in time as well. These were great and, and difficult challenges that people faced. And maybe I will just speak lastly, not to take so much time. The other one was housing. You know, people were not able to also support themselves because most people pay rent on monthly basis or on annual basis. Most of the parts um, in Nigeria, a lot of people pay rents for months or even going to years. Now that the regular flow of income for subsistence were no longer there, people were exposed. People could not pay their rent. So these are some of the issues, you know, that the COVID threw up and they are big issues. They are not resolved, but and they, are, they have also, also been there. But what COVID did was to expose the extent of these, you know, social inequality that have existed and we have overlooked over the period. I'm hoping that the attention of the relevant people, whether corporate or government, will be drawn appropriately to these concerns. And uh, yeah, just a short question. I mean, uh, what do you see as solutions? Uh, Tell so one, two examples. Uh, you listed food, jobs, health care, education, housing. Just one example, maybe also from your contribution from your company or others. Okay, what we did, um, if I understand you very well, how what's our contribution during this COVID? So what we did was to see how we could support, you know, the community where we operated. Number one, we had to provide you know, um, PPE materials, um, nose masks, um, sanitizers, and everything that people needed just to be able to keep safe. Number two, what we also did was to um, buy some things that would support people in their food stuff, you know. So we bought some food stuff for the community and distributed among the community people because at that time, we realized that malnutrition could just be a big problem. The pupils also... Yes, we could not go out and buy computers or internet for the people, but we ensure that the environment of learning, we made it conducive, you know, so that the pupils that could come to school will be able to learn. So we supported both the teachers and the pupils and provided enough, you know, um, support to ensure that the class was conducive, the learning period also was conducive. These were the little things we were able to do. But as an industry also, we also came together to support the hospitals, build um, centers for um, 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 isolation centers, provide um, the doctors that were in the front line with enough um, equipment for them to continue to do their work. So both as an individual company and as a collaborative effort, we were able to support them to see that um, the pressure was reduced. Thank you so much, uh, Blessing. Uh, this uh, analysis and also testimonial from uh, Nigeria. Uh, we switch to um, to Stuart Hutton, Chief Investment Officer of uh, Simply Ethical UK. Simply Ethical. So, simple solutions for complex problems are what is your analysis and your contribution that you and solutions that you propose for this uh, really worrying uh, social inequality as described also by Blessing. Well, one, one would hope, Christoph, that there were simple solutions, but uh, s simple solutions don't exist in isolation. They have to kind of work together. And uh, I, I, in a blessing, I think you raised four really good, healthy perspectives around 
four key criteria where we're seeing immense inequalities around food, healthcare, education and housing. I'm going to step slightly to the left of this now in terms of a slightly broader perspective where we come from. Um, and I say we on the basis of, you know, the, the broader economic analysis that we do around this kind of situation. Um, COVID hasn't created uh, inequality. Uh, we have to remember that. And we've seen many ways in which, you know, extreme circumstances have impact on the way social inequality increases. And this isn't something new. Um, what is really interesting when talking about inequality, I mean, even on a social scale, it's actually the impact of, of something like a financial crisis that leads to greater inequality and evolving discriminations. And I think that result is the kind of key issue at hand in some ways. Um, w war, for example, has always been one of those extreme causes that creates you know, such difficult situations to resolve. And it's been the comparison to the recent events of the pandemic that has described financially a bit like being at war. And and it's really, sort of really interesting. And, and I'd say kind of in some ways some creative thoughts on what's going wrong. Uh, I mean, like in war, the pandemic has had an effect across the globe and many different sectors in society. And it's been indiscriminate in killing people, taking loved ones from partners and children and parents and friends. Um, and it may well have a greater impact on the elderly and the already sick. However, as a society, it's the wider impact that has a very long tail. Um, I mean, in some way, we will see this impact for many, many years to come. Uh, this recent crisis will have a financial impact from as far as the governments and what the governments have had to do. Um, and obviously, I look primarily at the developed world here in terms of the US, the Europe, the EU and the UK. Um, and right down to those who can no longer find work to support their family. In the UK, we had something called the furlough scheme that has been in place for the last year or so. And that's kind of provided a line of support to employees and employers alike that has felt like a bit of a financial lifeline to many. And it may be the short term bolstering of the economy to get us back out and moving again. However, social inequality manifests in many disguises. And it is the alone, the elderly, uh, those who are sick, those who are often disenfranchised in society that have from the beginning, not being able to find the way forward from this. Now, we know that generally diseases are largely preventable and we can find cures, we can find vaccines and we can find ways to manage these issues. However, it is those with preconditions. And I'm not just talking about sickness, but I'm including everything. I'm including things like mental health and those kind of circumstances. And this is, has basically exacerbated this situation. We know that the poorer in social economic circumstances are generally more exposed to infection and often are unable to self-isolate due to a variety of situations, whether it be family links and support, community engagement and those kind of areas. Um, I mean, in terms of addressing this, and I'm just trying to think of your two questions, Christoph, that you put to us uh, prior to this. I mean, I'll keep it brief and we can talk about it more, kind of, I think, amongst us. Um, it's, but but I'm, what I'm conscious, it's not something we just talk about. I think we need to take action. I think it is right now about data. I think we have an immense amount of information being available to us and data. And how we manage that data and processes is going to give us stress to how we can use such things like technology to drive change, to drive a transformation that have, you know, could resolve many of the matters that lead to inequalities. Um, you know, in conclusion, the last 18 months have highlighted, highlighted many of the issues at hand. And with the climate emergency still centre stage, we need to take a long, hard look at everything we do. We need to not just address inequalities, but we also need to see how we can eradicate many of the causes of this and actually work towards basically these common goals. Uh, in, you know, in conclusion, this, the most important, in, in the words of His Holiness, Pope Francis, from his encyclical letter, Laudato Si, um, he said to leave no one behind. I will pause there, Christoph. Yeah, before going to the third speaker, let me just add one one point. I mean, um, as chief investment officer, you 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 know that uh, on one hand we have this big challenge of inequality and social uh, stress uh, in uh, in uh, the the poor uh, part, but we have at the same time still this uh, huge wealth accumulation. At the same time of the period of the pandemic, now as the chief of uh, investment officer, what would you say to your peers in the investment world? Um, risk taking, uh, 
or do we say yeah it's it's, it's too risky to go now to to uh, these uh, deprived uh, areas or uh, what what is your investment thought or the contribution of investments to solve it's a big issue but just one few thoughts well, if you'd asked me that question 15 or 20 years ago, it would have been a, a lot more kind of uh, fundamentally about the performance of companies and the amount of dividends they pay out and the profitability, EBITDA and all these other wonderful fundamentals we look at on a regular basis. They are still important. Profit is not necessarily an evil or a wrong thing. You know, profit used in the right way is about prosperity. And prosperity is this wider kind of focus around doing good. We can now say you can invest for good and do good and still make money from it. There is an equation that now exists around this. I have a slightly, um, the benefit, simply ethical, we, uh, our focus is around Sharia compliant investing. So we have a value-based initiative around the faith that follows this, that drives this focus around, the, you know, we must not do harm against man and the planet. There, there is something which is, you know, kind of within the DNA of it and so it's not to kind of to take too much of a detailed focus on this right now. So, yeah. so as my hat with my CIO on, there's no excuse, Christoph. We can work. Now, this is a transformation. This is not an overnight sensation. We need to work very carefully and diligently because there are very clever people out there who also, we talk about greenwashing and ESG washing, who can also very cleverly disguise something to make it seem like you're doing good. We have to work hard at this. We need to collaborate well and we need to kind of get this conditioning around how we can also invest for prosperity. And uh, I, I'm very positive about it, as you can probably tell. Thank you very much. Um... Our third speaker, and uh, for those who joined a bit later, I just apologize again that the two ladies who are on the list, uh, Christina Calvo from Costa Rica and Ong Lei An from Singapore, unfortunately did not uh, join us, but we have three um, uh, from the private sector who are uh, all um, engaged in social issues, but at the same time, uh, you need to run your business uh, in um, uh, uh, simply ethical uh, investments in the pipeline infrastructure in Nigeria. And now, uh, <clears throat> Sunday, you come from the football as a, as a sports um, um, a celebrity, so to say, now shifted uh, to, the, to the recycling sector and industry. So what is the recycling? Oh, First of all, maybe also what uh, can sport uh, contribute to overcome social inequality in post-COVID period? Uh, many events in sport had to be cancelled, as we know. Um, is there still a possibility on that? And then, but then uh, your main uh, current job on on uh, on uh, bio uh, trade, bio trade, and uh, recycling. What, what is the challenge there, and uh, how can you contribute? To your, what are the solutions you see uh, to overcome social inequality in a post-COVID period? Because recycling is also under much stress through this uh, um, through this pandemic. You have the floor, Sunday. Unmute. So can you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, I just want to thank you for, for having me here. And I thank uh, the two other brothers uh, who have already given their own view. I think I'm in the same page with you. And it's really important to, to as you said, start to, to walk now, stop talking. We should try to do something because COVID actually came unexpectedly. Okay, for the first time. We agree. It catch every one of us on our some of the country who have uh, had something like Ebola before, like Sierra Leone, like Guinea, they were a bit prepared for such situation. So some of those countries are well organized. They already knew how to tackle such diseases or pandemic before. So talking about the other areas of the world, it's a catastrophe. As you said, it's a catastrophe for for we that are working in the recycling sectors. The first two weeks, garbages all over the areas. You saw rats, rats. 
you saw dogs. You see such things only maybe in Africa or, or Asia. Blessing, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, here, we were so shocked because now, for those people working in the recycling sectors, the workers, they were so afraid to touch even those gloves, those masks thrown away. You see panics, panics, panic. We have to develop another strategy to get our workers in, 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 to, to give them such a courage that, look, touching this glove, touching this mask, doesn't mean automatically you will be infected because you can see them sweating. You sweat, you see sweat coming down the, their heads. It's for us. It's also a shock because we just have to fit in such into such a situation. It's it's not an easy thing at all. I'm blessing you. Made mention of something. Food. It's also catastrophe because when you have lockdown. There are some people selling waters on the street, selling mangoes on the street, selling handkerchief on the street. They live from such a uh, small scale business to, to, to keep their family moving, to keep their family uh, to, to get food, to eat, to drink. They were cut off. So actually, in part of the Western world here, it's something different. In Africa, where the COVID is not really 100% uh, effective, you have through this lockdown, we have a lot of problems because I have telephone calls 24 hours. Please, we cannot eat. We cannot drink. We cannot do this. We cannot do that. From that alone, I'm really chocked up. I was chocked up. I have two, three telephones. I have to charge them 24 hours. It's, it's something that we, in the first instance, not really good for our world. Okay, talking about sport. I'm somebody that came from the from this area. Imagine a footballer going into a field without spectators. That's an oral. It's oral. Because we we sport men, spectators, it's something that gives us power. When you come into the stadium, you go you march into that field. The moment you watch, you march into that field, you see different kind of uh, people, flags, people dancing, people singing. Your adrenaline will easily, quickly jump up. You are motivated. And then now you are playing in front of a ghost, empty stadium. It kills the spirit. For me, as a sportsman, I said, OK, football was not so much interesting again because you can hear, OK, the players and the trainers, when they talk, you hear them talking. But it was so boring and have love friends still playing out there they say look it's a war it's a fight you have 11 people on the other side you need to tackle and now you need to tackle your own self your own spirit your own motivation it it's not really good so for me covid came but that doesn't mean we should shut the door because the lockdown i'm not i'm not condemning the government because they were caught unaware some of them accepted they made a mistake because they don't want to to be blamed after because this country is locking down the other country is locking down you don't want to lock down and at the end you will be blamed for that so some of those leaders accepted they made a mistake what we should have done was because when the, during the first lockdown i will not blame anybody for that because it was a shock and we were just trying to prevent each uh, to prevent ourselves from this pandemic but the second COVID, the second lockdown, or in Switzerland, we don't have much lockdown. We are so lucky. But when I look at the rest of the world, the moment they opened, the, 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 the lockdown was, uh, was lifted. People came back, they make parties, and then they said, okay, many people were being infected more than the first one. So it's, it's also a big problem. So in times of recycling, as I was saying, for us, it was not so it's, it was not so easy. It's a hard stuff for us because getting all those, you see, baggies, mountains of, uh, of, of, of garbages. And what kind and of solutions you see to, for solutions from your side? The solution from my side is we have to plan. The plan should be in place this way. The government should try to work with the private sectors like we, because most of those companies, some of them are, are so choked up because they don't have even uh, a bread to breathe anymore. So in this kind of, I think some of those companies, they need more fundings, fundings, 
because you see many of the workers, some of them are sick. They cannot, they cannot work 100% anymore. So you have to just try to just do something. We have to create places in the company where you, this one has to be there two, two, kilometer, two meters away from each other is something new. So my advice will be that the government should have, in the near future, they should try to set up an organization, maybe a committee that will be working with private sectors, with company, so that these kind of things, those people that need their funds so that they can help them, like you now, Stuart, to investment. I'm not saying you should borrow them money. Try to invest in this company so that they can at least do something. Like in the recycling sectors, we can we, we try to put something up so that we can work with small machines. Machines that can pick up all those garbages also. We don't have this thing before, but we have to create them immediately because when you see your workers getting panicking, because we have to Im invest also in the health of the workers. Very, very important. Most of the companies collapse because they forgot to took their workers along with them because your, your, your prosperity lies also in the workers. When you invest in your workers, you have to do something about them because they are the one that kept your company flowing. And from 60%, from 100%, if you have 70% already dead, your company is going down the drain. You won't come up again. So most of the mistake that we have made was we forgot to take the workers along with us to invest in their health. That should not happen anymore. So my advice for the government or the local government or whatsoever uh, association is to invest in the workers, very, very important. In the health sectors, it's very, very important because most of the people, they really don't know what is going to happen. So confusion all over the places. And I believe we have also shortage of um, places you can go for, for, for examination, which people really don't know. So all this problem contributed to something that really, as you said, Stuart, the effect of this thing is really going to come later. We're experiencing it little by little now, slowly by slowly. It's coming up. But thank, thank God you. everybody is awake now. So for me, I don't want to keep everybody here long waiting. The solution should be we should join hands together, join our hands together and trying to bring up a solution that we fits everybody instead of this taking its own decision, that taking its own decision. It won't help us. We have to come up as a team, as a football team, like 11 players who has to work together with each other because you can't do it alone. So when we, when we apply this strategy of the sport world, we will try to make this world at least a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sunday, for uh, these insights and uh, also describing in a dramatic way how the, the waste and recycling sector was uh, dramatically affected by this uh, non-ability to to uh, recycle and to collect waste and then the danger, the fears, which continues, uh, of course, less now in most of the countries, but still it's not banned. Uh, COVID is not over. <clears throat> um, la let us uh, look at and I invite also the, the listeners uh, in the room, uh, if you have any uh, remarks or questions, just uh, place it. Uh, uh, or uh, show up and then you uh, we can connect. Uh, but uh, among uh, the speakers, <clears throat> uh, Blessing, you started with uh, the, the, the key issue of access to resources as a key issue, uh, which in a way addressed all the other speakers too. Uh, access to financial resources too, but also health, uh, food, uh, education, housing, so the basic needs as we would call them. Um, which are at stake uh, during uh, and through this uh, COVID. Now, if you look at uh, investments, what kind of investments are needed in which way in order to address this access to resources in that field? We can uh, maybe uh, start with uh, your last uh, remark uh, Sunday on investment in health of workers, but also investing in survival of the companies so that because if they are laid out if they lose their job, of course, uh, their health is at stake too. So what is your uh, view that what can be done in terms of investments of, uh, to, to help as a major contribution to overcome uh, these challenges? I should take over, me, Sunday. Whoever uh, or uh, the others. <laughs> 
Blessing. All right. Uh, so if you want me to, if you want me to go on, that's that's fine. So great. Thank you so much for that, and thank you so and Esther for um, great insight on this matter as well. I, I think if we if we look at um, the position that I presented before, it's it's quite very easy to say to the if we can invest in these areas, you know, where people actually. Um, had serious challenges and where they felt that um, there was uh, unequal distribution of valued resources, then we, we will be solving the problem. But how do we really invest in this? How and what approach should we take? Now, I will speak to you about four things quickly. One, the cost of governance. In Africa, for example, we have huge cost of governance. If we can address cost of governance and begin to uh, invest in infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, now, what the people want is not for government to go around handing out envelope, you know, to them. What the people want is they want infrastructure. People, Nigerians especially, are creative, they are hardworking. What they need is the environment to work. Now, how can the government do that? They can start from cutting down the cost of governance and then partnership you know, with institutions. We have the PPP project, we have the... Um, um, many things that people can do together. Start talking about investment. So how can the private and the public sector come together? First of all, identify what these key gaps are in the system. And two, we begin to draw up a sustainable plan, not just a short-term plan, on how we can address these issues. If they are not addressed, they are, it's, it's going to be very catastrophic in the future. The second one is for purposeful and... Uh, what I would call conscious leadership, you know, in delivering um, valued resources. Purposeful and conscious leadership. It's not something we just talk about because um, of political propaganda. It's not what we report because we just want people to think that we are good corporations. No, it's not enough. We have to come together and be deliberate and conscious about how we deliver this common good to the people. Now, this is where we can start talking about sustainability. That takes me to the third point I want to mention, and that is from the corporate angle. We need to embrace ESG as a consideration for corporates. Now, looking at ESG, you're addressing the issue of environment, and you are saying how sustainable will the environment be? You're addressing the issue of the social fabric, which is the issue we are talking about today. The social, the inequality that exists in communities, in employees, in all the areas. We want to do business today and be profitable on the short term, and then we are not sustainable on the long term. We have to do business while we view it both from the sustainability angle, while we are making profit. And of course, finally, I will say, we also have to, for Africa now and for Nigeria, there is need to declare the state of emergency, you know, with education and in healthcare. We need to declare a state of emergency. If we continue to grow, you know, um, it was projected that poverty will increase with about 2 million people in 2020, but with the pandemic, it's estimated that we go to about 7 million people in 2020, 2021. That is catastrophic. What we have globally is people are reducing the level of poverty. If we have in Africa the level of poverty increasing, that is a disaster for the world. So we need to come together and invest in sustainable infrastructure and that is where we can continue to deal with the issue of social inequality. Thank you very much uh, and you uh, Stuart? I, I've really enjoyed these contributions from um, from Sunday and also Blessing. I think this has been really interesting because um, you know this, this kind of growing inequalities is something that we all talk about and we've seen it over time. You know history has lots of information and an understanding of how this has evolved and we've not We've taken steps at times and we've never really resolved those matters, not as a, as a, as a global community. We've been able to kind of, you know, identify and do, do a particular areas, but, you know, social inequality is something that will continue. And, you know, how do you, how do you make a judgment and what is social inequality? And it's very difficult for someone within a situation that can necessarily understand, you know, what their level of social inequality is. There's, there's, this is this is a very complex scenario that's going to take a lot of data and information and understanding to be able to find what I call, call as the real true causes of social inequality. I, I'm gonna, I wanted to bring up one, one or two points. On the back of that, I think collaboration, you're absolutely right, is something which is key here. 
we need to collaborate, we need to coordinate that collaboration, and we need to create the harmonization needed together to be able to work towards common causes and common good so that we can understand as a broader society the actions we need to take. That is often lost in translation. It's not really just transparent as it should be. I mean, the SDGs have come about to create these common goals, this kind of time frame, these kind of focus around different areas. It also focuses, of course, how interdependent they are. So let's kind of translate that across to social inequality. We have to understand how we can't de- work in silos. We have to work across these together so that we can start seeing the impact. And I'm going to relate to it now. I have to excuse me, Sunday. I, I'm not a big football man. I'm a rugby man. Um, my, my family background is partly South Africa and, uh, you know, the box, go the box. Um, you know, have a, a big. And, but we've always talked about investments, about, you know, when we look at the different investments we have, we have uh, a, a rugby team. If you had 15 prop forwards on the, on the team, you know, you're going to have a tremendous scrum. You're going to push the team away, but they're not going to score any tries because they're not going to run the length of the pitch. You know, you have different technical players so we need to take that analogy it's like a football if you have you know say 15 if you had 11 goalkeepers you know um well you might just about to get away with something but you have to have different types of people now that is where we need to see that coordination come in and that is where you're seeing you know the government almost like the the trainer on the sideline they're the chairman of the club you know saying look we can support this but it's no good just the government throwing money into a big hole and saying deal with social inequality in the same way that the government. And I don't want to get political here because I think that's not what this is about. We don't want the government to also come up with necessary what it thinks are the solutions. We need to work in this kind of joined up way to try and kind of get to something where we are. So if I have one kind of focus here to bring to the table, Christoph and everybody, I think it's about, you know, rather than focus on how we're going to fund this, how we're going to drive money in, let's focus towards something which is people centric. Mm. Let's bring together community engagement, people to the center of this actual conversation not money. The money is there. We can find it. We know that governments have the ability to create it, but whether in a, a kind of a sustainable way or not, there are things we can do. But let's focus and make this people centric, going right back to what you were talking about, the beginning blessing, you know, food, healthcare, education, housing. These are people centric problems. These are not yeah. financial. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, um, contribute uh, not as a moderator but uh, as a, but a panelist also. Uh, I think uh, in addition to all these very important issues that you raised, I'd like to to raise one uh, soft, soft uh, factor which is uh, critical in this uh, COVID and post-COVID times because everybody is very um, uh, uh, in an uncertain situation. We don't have lack of information at le- uh, especially at the beginning. Uh, we still have very controversial scientific views and that creates a lot of uh, insecurity. That means people are thirsting for uh, clear and simple answers. That's why populism is growing, why religious leaders are growing uh, in, in importance. And uh, I was talking on, on many events now across uh, continents on also this whole issue of conspiracies, for example, and value orientation. And I think one uh, important thing is that we uh, have to overcome inequality also by um, tackling with this, uh, in my view, really dangerous development that people now go into their bubble of theories, they attack others, and that's the counter narrative to collaboration. Instead of collaborating, they attack each other, they uh, have mistrust in governments, mistrust in scientists, mistrust in the, uh, in the pharmaceuticals, mistrust in the religious organizations, and this mistrust then hinders cooperation. So that's why I think when in order to overcome inequality, we also need uh, to build trust because trust is the precondition for uh, cooperation and uh, for uh, also people centric means listening to them, but also uh, being able to contradict and to resist where all these conspiracies are really like poisoning the environment. And uh, I, uh, you from Nigeria, you know it well. In Nigeria also, you have uh, millions of people who follow preachers, 
who are still deniers of uh, even saying, yeah, look, uh, COVID is, is still a phantom or is still construed by some, some enemies or whatever. So I think the religious organizations, I'm coming from a religious background as a, as a pastor by origin, uh, but also the academic sector, the political sector, the private sector, the, uh, the academic sector, the schools, the, the health sector, they have to cooperate, but also in uh, overcoming this. This would be my uh, additional um, aspect. And uh, also investments are not working if there is mistrust. I would never invest in a, in a country or in a company where there is not a, uh, at least a, a solid basis of trust. That's why building trust, I think, is so key. That's just my uh, own contribution. And now going back to the moderator's role, we have five minutes left. Maybe you have to, you want to react to one or the other or to my uh, contribution. Um, I don't see at the moment comments from participants, but uh, so let's uh, continue to share among ourselves. Who wants to come back to one of these aspects? Before I use then the last minute for the summary. Sunday. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your for your for your perfect and excellent view. I think you've said everything. You've said everything to overcome this inequality. As you said, also thought we need harmony. If harmony is missing, everything is just slide down. We need harmony, and the most important thing is the asset. We are the asset. And the company, the industry, she also realized that I'm, all, I'm always talking about the workers. The workers are also the assets of those company or the, the local government. So what we need to do is now, as you said, we need to come together, put our heads together. Maybe in Africa, we have this system that in this street, you have the landlord, the landlord organization. They meet each other every week to talk about their street. You have the Emmanuel Street, you have the Thomas Street, you have the Stout Street. So every street has got its own organization. That is the way you can tackle this thing one by one. And every street has a leader. So you submit your own proportion. The other one's method is on. So we can tackle this thing. We don't need to say we're 200 million. We cannot get over all this problem. So if we tackle this like football, I always take the example of football because 11 players have got his own duty. You have a striker. You have a forwarder, you have a left backward striker whatsoever. So what we should do is come together, put our heads together, because this is not the end of this story. This pandemic is nothing that is going to fly out just within some few days. So we need to get prepared for whatsoever will be coming again so that we will not be caught unaware and we should be prepared because... COVID has destroyed life. It destroyed many lives. For the first time in my life, I see people saying goodbye to their parents on, on Skype, on video. It's an oral. I cannot eat. Somebody saying goodbye to his father, dying on the bed because of a pandemic. This should not happen anymore. So we should try to develop a way to come with each other to find a solution so that we can live. We have to live with this thing. We have to live with it. We just need to create a solution. As you said, we don't need to throw money everywhere, but we need to teach the people how to catch the fish. So that's my own view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, two final statements from Stuart and from uh, Blessing, and then I uh, summarize in a few words. Stuart? Okay, I'm going to keep this really short. Uh, Christoph, uh, we've, we've talked about a lot today. I, I think you're right. We need to get more actions. Um, I think um, we... Okay, this may sound a little naive, so I apologize now, but I actually think we've moved beyond naivety here. If we all on this planet, and many of us do believe that we have some solutions and some ideas to get us in the right way to resolve social inequality, to resolve many of the matters that are the causes of social inequality, why aren't we doing it better? We need to see this work as a global team. And I think there are two words that I think I'm going to put right out there to everybody to help understand this. One is... We need to be aspirational. We need to aspire to work as a global team and we need to seek aspirational goals to achieve them. If we aspire, we will achieve it. The second word is courage. We need to have courage. We need to bring courage to the table. It is not going to be easy, this. This is going to be a tough journey. It has been a tough journey, as you've already said Sunday. You know, but we are here together. Let's resolve it. Let's do something good and let's get 
working together in that right direction. Thank you very much. Uh, blessing, 30 seconds. Thank you um, so much, Todd. That that was great. So I will say, and uh, maybe adding to what Todd have said, we need to focus on sustainability. No, the short term cannot hold together what we have right now. We need to focus on sustainability, for sustainability of environment, sustainability of our social fabric. And to get sustainability, we come back to the issue and the point of discussion today, and that is collaboration. Collaboration among corporations, collaboration between corporations and government, co collaboration at individual levels. When we all fuse this together, then we can boast of a sustainable future. Thank you very much. And let me uh, try to summarize a few things. First point, what uh, was said uh, people-centric. Um, uh, people-centric, and I heard from all of you on a global level, not just my people, my tribe, my nation, my company, but people uh, who are in basic needs, that basic needs orientation together with people-centric. The second point, collaboration, cooperation between sectors, all of us uh, underline that. And that's a message that uh, I think is very important to overcome inequality. And the third um, uh, uh, I hear is, but within this co cooperation, we have different roles. The government has a different role, uh, you know, the, the company leader, the workers, the 